Let's take a look at some of the things that happened this week in artificial intelligence that you may have unfortunately missed. Lots of these are really interesting, so watch until the end because trust me when I say you'll be mighty surprised by what you see. Coming in at number one is of course Google's DeepMind. They actually made this really cool project called Tapir. Essentially what this project does is it's able to independently track any point in a video. Now, you might be wondering, why is this really cool? Well, if we compare it to other examples that we've seen before, it just isn't as effective. You see, what Tapir is able to do is get a point on an object and keep it there for a very long time. And if you're wondering about the applications, this just has many and many different applications, from enhancing our video editing software to being able to track things independently of what we see. It's definitely going to change a lot of industries, but of course, as you know, this is still in its early stages. So with Google DeepMind, we know that they constantly release new things. And I gotta be honest, Tap it is one of those things that I will think is going to be great for the future. Then we got this state of the art project from Google. Now, what you're looking at is Imogen, unprecedented photorealism and a deep level of language understanding. So this is from Google Research's brain team. Now, essentially why this is so cool is that this wasn't just a research paper. Google had been working on this for quite some time and finally they managed to release this. So what you can see here is a dog looking into the mirror, seeing a cat, a dragon fruit wearing a karate seat belt in the snow, a peranium sitting on the throne. There are many different things that you can think about. Now, essentially, if you're wondering what exactly is this? Is this like mid journey? Well, yes, it's like mid journey, but What's cool about this is that Imogen isn't just an image editor. They also have Imogen Video and an Imogen Video Editor. Now, Imogen Video, as you can see right here, isn't as good as many other things, but it is still in its early stages where you're able to generate video from text. Now, what was also cool about this release by Google was they actually released this to the public. So from this video that you're able to see, you can see that you can write a prompt in the text box below and upload an image. And then of course you can edit it. It's actually really, really similar to Adobe's new Firefly thing. So I would say once again, Google are showing this that literally every week they're committed to releasing new and innovative AI products that we are going to be using. And finally, finally, we did get this one released. So this is of course, Image Vertex on AI, and I'll leave a link to this one in the description. Then of course, this is the title of the video. Apparently, China's Baidu claims its Ernie bot beats ChatGPT on key tests as artificial intelligence race heats up. So Baidu said on Tuesday, the artificial intelligence model called Ernie 3.5 outperformed OpenAI's ChatGPT and GPT-4 in several key areas. The Chinese search revealed that Ernie bot in March and has since publicly been testing it in China. The chatbot is based on Baidu's foundational AI model called Ernie. The focus on Baidu's advancements underscore the intense competition taking place in the area of generative AI, with technology giants in the United States and China rapidly advancing developments. So this article basically states, that GPT-4 was beaten, a large language model created by Chinese developers. Now, of course, an important distinction is to make that Ernie 3.5 developed by China did beat GPT-4 in Chinese language tests, according to the Science Journal. So this goes to show that although these are some small headways that certain individual AI companies are making, it is important to note that rapid artificial intelligence development is going to continue regardless of whatever jurisdiction that we are in. Of course, there are some people calling for the slowdown of GPT-4 and of course the slowdown of the development of GPT-5. But we can see here across the globe, everywhere, companies, individuals, corporations are rushing to make their own AI chatbots, which they're of course trying to surpass GPT-4 with. As is right now, that is the very best benchmark. So it will be interesting to see maybe if a month from now, two months from now, three months from now, GPT-4 does completely get beaten. Then of course, we had Google announce their virtual try-on feature, which is going to revolutionize online clothes shopping. Essentially what it does, it allows users to see how clothes look on real models with different body shapes and sizes. I think this is a great addition to the workspace because this is going to allow individuals who have maybe a unique body to be able to see exactly how that piece of clothing fits onto their body. It was a really intriguing research paper, but we know stuff like this is going to be implemented because we've seen small things like this before. It's definitely really, really cool. And I think rapid AI advancements like this are ones that definitely make the world easier to use 
and a better place. Now, what Google also included was they also announced that they're updating their search generative experience. This was something that took everyone by storm, but at the same time, we weren't that surprised because we did notice that they were talking about this in their Google I.O. event. So of course, essentially what it does is it gives an AI generated response rather than a single search query. So you know how on Google, sometimes you search something and you really can't find what you're looking for. With SGE, what they do is they tailor it specifically to you, to all your cookies, to all your preferences, and then you're able to talk with the chatbot and find exactly what you're looking for. I find that these kind of integrations into the web are definitely going to be much more effective. And since people do use Google anyways over Bing, I think that that is going to remain the user choice. The only thing is, when will they release this to the public? As you know, Google is slowly trying to rush out these products, but at the same time, they're quite scared because their AI hasn't proven to be too good just yet. Then of course, we had a company called AMD release a new AI chip specialized for generative AI. Now, I have to be honest with you guys, if you don't know who AMD is, then maybe you're not someone who's that much into computers. But for those of you who are, you likely know who AMD are. If you've heard of Nvidia, you'll likely have heard of AMD. They're essentially direct competitors with Nvidia taking the lion's share of the graphics card market. Now, AMD, what they've done is they've released this card to the supply for generative AI related products. And apparently they described their M1300X chip as the world's most advanced accelerator for generative AI. And apparently it's expected to attract interest from big cloud providers such as Amazon or Microsoft, but they haven't actually specified who's going to be using it. And it will be interesting because if AMD is able to create a super chip that is far superior than Nvidia's, then it's likely going to push Nvidia to push the boundaries even further. And to be honest with you guys, Nvidia does seem to be doing things at a increasingly faster rate with many different advancements in AI that we're going to get. Then of course, we had some groundbreaking news where we had quicker cures. How in silico medicine, it uses generative AI to accelerate drug discovery. So essentially, in silico used generative AI for each step of the preclinical drug discovery process to identify a molecule that a drug compound could target, generate novel drug candidates, gauge how well these candidates would bind with the target and even predict the outcome of clinical trials. And doing this using traditional methods would have cost more than $400 million and taken up to six years. But with generative AI, in silico accomplished them for one tenth of the cost and one third of the time, reaching the first phase of clinical trials and just two and a half years after beginning the project. So like we stated before, although AI might not just make one huge jump, it's every small incremental jump that advances society as a whole. In fact, when we also look at another Nvidia blog post, we can see that their recent H100 GPUs have set a new standard for generative AI in the debut machine learning performance benchmark. So this is absolutely incredible. We can see that with these advancements in generative AI and of course in processing power and in chip speed, we know that large language models and all sorts of artificial intelligence programs, including the training of these models, including the retraining of these models is going to get a lot faster, especially with Nvidia's race to dominate the entire AI industry we could see rapid improvements in artificial intelligence. So it's important to note that although these changes aren't groundbreaking in terms of a primary use level, if we can get the hardware to increase the speed at which we can get things done, we could see an increased rate of actual research and discovery from drug discovery, as we just talked about, to other machine learning research. Then we had something that was really interesting in terms of robotics and artificial intelligence. As you know, AI is eventually going to be involved in robots. But so what we had here was something released by Meta AI. So if you don't know, of course, Mark Zuckerberg has a company and they do have a very robust AI division. In that division, they're constantly working on new things. And this was something really cool. So they demonstrate the ability to use your own language in order to talk to your robot and to get it to do very effective things. So here you can see the user has said, bring me the box of chocolates, the cereal box, the pill bottle, and put them on the bedroom table. I mean, for the average person, this might not pose any great application. But can you imagine this in a care home, in a home with a person who has specific disabilities or is unable to reach certain items? This could most certainly provide a very useful application for those tasks. And especially where sometimes you might not be able to type, just being able to use your voice 
to a robot to be able to get you something and for it to be able to understand you is going to be very effective. Now, what was also cool about this is that in terms of the robustness, the navigation policy is able to take an alternative route to avoid collision with humans. In addition, the pick policy is able to change the grasping location if the object moves or if the base is not close enough to the receptacle. And essentially, what that means is that this kind of robot isn't just going to fall over if there is going to be some mild disturbance. As you know, life has its disturbances. Sometimes we might fall over, objects might drop, and these robots are able to adapt to that situation even if these things occur. So take a look at some of these tasks because it's very likely that in the future, maybe you might not see these robots in your home, but maybe through our cities or maybe in certain workplaces, robots that take natural language commands are going to be very common, especially once we do manage to get the cost of these robots completely down. It's going to be interesting to see everywhere that they could be. Then something from Singularity. Next week, the United Nations is set to host a summit in Geneva where tech gurus are going to be discussing AI alongside 50 plus robots. This is going to be extremely interesting as we are going to see the wider conversation surrounding artificial intelligence. It's important to know that viewers like you who do watch this channel are definitely more clued in on artificial intelligence than some of our world leaders. And although that might seem like an outlandish statement, as you can see from Congress's grilling of Sam Altman, this couldn't be further from the truth. Artificial intelligence is moving very, very quickly, and sometimes people just don't have time to catch up. So it will be interesting to see where the world's mind is on artificial intelligence, especially with these robots as well. Then we had something about OpenAI, and this one was also quite controversial. You see, OpenAI and Microsoft were allegedly sued for $3 billion over alleged ChatGPT privacy violations. The lawsuit claimed that OpenAI secretly scraped 300 billion words from the internet. The lawsuit, which was filed on June 28th in federal court in San Francisco, includes 16 anonymous plaintiffs claimed that OpenAI secretly scraped 300 billion words from the internet without registering as a data broker or obtaining the proper consent. Now, this is something that is going to continually happen. I mean, Adobe seems like the only company who's trying to actually protect people's data when it's actually taking their content from the internet. We know that Mid Journey earlier this year did actually have a situation where people are trying to sue them because of course, as you know, Mid Journey scraped millions of images from the internet in order to build their AI platform and they didn't pay anything to the creators of the original AI art that they stole it from. So it will be interesting to see how this plays out in the court of law, but I can assure you that OpenAI and Microsoft have billions of dollars to fight this lawsuit. And I will be wondering if this is going to go to a settlement or this will change the way that data laws are going to be created and how certain large language models are going to be created. As you know, currently, many people just take the data from the internet as is. And is it going to be now a requirement that when training a large language model, you need to verify legally what kind of data it was trained on and where you got that data from? That could have severe implications because if you have to go through an extended process where you need to verify all the data sources, it could mean a huge slowdown because data collection is quite hard. Although it could also mean that data collection improves. As you know, when looking at large language, models, data is the number one bottleneck in language model performance. So it will definitely be interesting to see how this plays out. And then of course, we had the very interesting software that is actually very unique in terms of what it does. This software is called DragGAN. Essentially, it's a software where you can manipulate any image by dragging a point on an image and moving it as if it kind of was a 3D model. I mean, this kind of technology is only possible with AI, and I'm wondering what the true application of this will be. Maybe Photoshop may integrate this into its software, but it is still a little bit buggy, but it does have quite a lot of applications for just manipulating an image in a way that we never thought was possible. So DragGAN, I gotta be honest, it looks really weird, but at the same time, it is very, very and whilst you're taking a look at some of these examples, let me know if you're going to be trying out this drag GAN because as you know, lots of AI papers do get released a week and rarely often do we get the ability to try these out. So with this, it's actually very effective that we can now actually try this out and use it as well as we want to. 
Then we had another research paper, extending the context window of large language models. This work done extend the context window of large language models like Llama up to 32,000 tokens. Essentially, what you can do is you can have Llama remember the last 32,000 tokens in your messages, which essentially means it gets more effective at processing larger volumes of text. And this is what we want to see, because as you know, one of the main bottlenecks from the earlier versions of ChatGPT and early large language models is that they simply cannot remember what was said earlier on in the conversation, which leads to a very limited function in terms of certain applications. With this paper and with others that we've seen before, this is going to prove very effective at allowing us to do much, much more. From analyzing books to analyzing bank statements to analyzing poetry, this is going to be something that we could all use very well. And of course, as you're seeing, this is going to be widely used, with GPT-4 already having its 32,000 context window length already implemented.